Hello, this is the program on constitutional government at Harvard. I'm Harvey Mansfield, and our guest today is Yasha Monk. Yasha Monk is Associate Professor of the Practice of International Affairs at Johns Hopkins University. He got his BA at the Cambridge University and a PhD at Harvard from the good old fashioned Harvard Government Department. He's an American citizen, was born in Munich. He has a weekly podcast, The Good Fight, with um, many important guests, especially Frank Fukuyama. And he's written a number of books. Uh, first, uh, Stranger in My Own Country, 2014, The People versus Democracy, 2018, The Age of Responsibility, Luck, Choice, and the Welfare State. And he, he's written one that's just come out called <clears throat> The Great Experiment, Why Diverse Democracies Fall Apart and How They Can Endure. And he's going to talk about that new book now. Thank you, Yash. Well, Harvey, thank you so much for, for having me. This brings uh, back very nice memories from a time as a graduate student in the department, uh, listening to great speakers and eating excellent cheese. So I'm only sad that we're being deprived of the cheese today since we're still virtual because of a pandemic. Uh, but it's very nice to see to see a few familiar and, and many new faces. Um, so, so yeah, I'm gonna talk, hopefully not for too long, because I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, about the new book, which has a strange kind of title and the title itself has an interesting backstory. So uh, when I was promoting the last book in Germany uh, in 2018, I went on Tages Themen, which is one of the big uh, new shows there, and I was asked about the, the, the reasons for the rise of populism, and I said that there was uh, a few different causes that had to do with the stagnation of living standards for average citizens, that it had to do with the rise of the internet and of social media, uh, and also I said it has to do uh, with the fact that we're now trying a, a historically unique experiment, um, namely to turn relatively homogeneous uh, societies into multi-ethnic and multi-religious ones. Um, and this is something uh, uh, that's going to cause real problems, but I think in the end, we're going to succeed. Um, now, you know, I thought the interview had gone fine. My mom, who doesn't, you know, who doesn't fully approve of any interview I do, said it went very well. Um, I switched off the phone and <clears throat> got on a plane to, to the United States. And uh, when I arrived, um, I switched the phone on and I had just dozens of emails and other messages denouncing me um, uh, because in the minds of some listeners on the extreme right, I had somehow uh, admitted that Angela Merkel and I were running uh, some nefarious experiment on the German people and in particular that we were trying to replace the German population uh, with this set of newcomers. So there was a misunderstanding about the term the great experiment. The, my listeners thought that I was talking about the kind of experiment that a chemistry teacher might uh, carry out in, in the ninth grade, where he comes in with two different fluids and he puts one to the other and things explode and he planned out the whole thing in order to illustrate some kind of chemical process. Uh, what I meant, of course, is an experiment more uh, like the founding fathers uh, said that they were engaged in a great experiment in democratic self-government or republican self-government uh, towards the end of the 18th century, at a time when similar attempts around the world um, uh, had failed for many centuries, in which there was no real reason to think uh, that it would be possible uh, to sustain a large-scale republic under modern conditions. And yet the circumstances forced them to try and make this work. So that, to me, is the starting point because uh, most uh, large-scale democracies we have in the world today have either been founded at a moment when they were very homogeneous. That is true, for example, of a country in which I grew up, uh, West German democracy, the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, stabilized and worked in part because the population of a country by 1948 had been made by the terrible crimes and injustices and, and wars and genocides of the first half of the 20th century to be, by historical standards, very homogeneous. And then there's another set of democracies like the United States, 
which have been diverse since their founding, but which also imposed a very clear racial and religious hierarchy uh, and exploited some of uh, the members, in particular African Americans, in the most extreme ways. Uh, and so in both of those places and in most democracies around the world, we now do face this unique uh, uh, starting point of highly ethnically and religiously diverse societies that are trying to treat all of our members as equals. And so the project of this book is threefold. It is to explain uh, why this is a very difficult undertaking. It is to explain uh, how I see the current state of this experiment uh, and actually uh, make a case for a relatively optimistic assessment of how we're doing relative to other diverse societies that have attempted this. And it's ultimately an, a, a, an attempt to use some of the tools of political theory as well as comparative politics uh, to create a vision for uh, the kind of society we should aim for if we want the great experiment to succeed. Uh, and in my comments today, I'll try to touch a little bit on each of those uh, three points. So starting out, why is this so difficult? Why is this so difficult? Uh, and I think, uh, so there's a little bit of echo there. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, the starting point that many people have is sort of naive optimism. And ironically, that can then lead to a lot of cynicism and pessimism, which say that a lot of people start by saying, well, why should this be hard? You know, how hard is it to be tolerant? How hard is it to get along with people who are different from you? How hard is it not to be a bigot, not to unfairly target your neighbor? Uh, but in the first part of the book, I really lay out uh, the reasons why, in fact, it is very difficult to build these deeply diverse societies. But it has to do with human psychology uh, the work of Henry Teifel, uh, the classic work in group psychology is very interesting there, I think. Um, he tried to understand why it is that groups are so likely uh, to motivate the members to favor the in-group and discriminate against the out-group, as we know from all kinds of experiments, from the Milgram experiment and others. He said, in order to answer this question, I'm going to do something very simple. I mean, I'm going to create groups but are so silly, but are so meaningless that the members are not going to discriminate in favor of the in-group, are not going to discriminate against the out-group. And then I can ladle on more features to these groups slowly until I get to the point where these uh, mechanisms of in-group favoritism kick in. And that'll tell us what it is about groups that makes them uh, potentially dangerous, that makes them have that kind of effect. Well, uh, he failed because when he brought a bunch of uh, kids from the suburbs of Bristol into the lab uh, and he showed them a sheet of paper with about 150 randomly uh, assigned dots on them and he asked them to estimate how many dots they were, uh, the kids, you know, some said 120, some said 180. Uh, and so he split them into the groups of underestimators and overestimators and had them play some games in which he assumed that they wouldn't favor underestimators over overestimators, because why would they? What a silly metric to use. But that turned out to be wrong. Just associating uh, the assortment of underestimators with the term your group was enough to make people favor members of the in-group. Um, uh, so even people who think that uh, they're not heavily motivated by this, tend to engage in this behavior. In fact, I, I teach undergrads who think of themselves as most tolerant people in the world, and perhaps some of them really are. Uh, but when I have them debate whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich, and then have them play a similar distribution game, it turns out the people who believe that a hot dog is a sandwich start to discriminate against the people who think that a hot dog is not a sandwich. So this groupishness is a fundamental fact of human society. And it's one of the things that makes it hard to build diverse societies. Now, of course, in reality, we know from looking at history that there are certain kinds of groups that hold particular power. And that when we look at the greatest crimes in history, at uh, the worst genocides, the worst wars, often the worst civil wars, not always, but very often, uh, they were fought along the lines of ethnic difference, of religious difference, uh, of racial difference, 
uh, to some extent of national difference. Uh, uh, so, so this is incredibly motivating in history. Now, as a good convinced Democrat, I might say, well, it should be democratic institutions that can help to solve this, right? If there's all these intergroup conflicts, we have mechanisms in a democracy to try and tamp down that conflict. And I think that is partially true. There are certain kinds of uh, constitutional mechanisms uh, that can reduce conflict, but the basic electoral mechanism actually often has the opposite effect. So one of the things that I was really struck by when I was thinking about this topic is that many of the most celebrated democracies in, in, in human history prided themselves in their ethnic purity, at least among the set of citizens who truly had a say. And some of the most celebrated epochs where different cultures coexisted with each other productively were actually monarchies or empires from Baghdad in the ninth century to Vienna in the 19th century. Uh, and there's a reason for that because in a monarchy, uh, I don't have any power and I have to trust the monarch and the same for you. So if you have more kids or if there's more immigrants coming into the society that are more like you than they are like me, it doesn't immediately change my standing. I have less reason to worry about it. A democracy is always a search for majorities. And so it is much easier to think if there's a lot more people coming in from your group than from my group, when suddenly you might be in the majority, suddenly you might be able to outvote me. Uh, and that leads to the forms of demographic panic, uh, which we can all see in our politics and which in fact, I think drove some of those responses uh, to my television interview. So this is uh, the case for why building diverse democracies really, really is hard and why it is that many diverse societies in the history of the world have gone wrong uh, in one of three ways that I describe in the book, uh, structured anarchy, uh, where different groups are so rival to each other that uh, they're not even willing to cooperate on building a state and you end up with uh, deep uh, poverty and uh, lack of public services, uh, often endemics of a war like in Afghanistan or in Somalia. Uh, forms of domination, uh, where one group takes on the power, is able to build the state, provide some real public services, build roads and public health systems and so on. But all of that at the cost of the extreme subjugation of one group, as the case with chattel slavery in the United States. And finally, fragmentation. Uh, societies which decide uh, to split power up to devolve it to different groups to such an extent uh, that there's never any form of shared identity and you get those frozen conflicts, which then often end up breaking into civil war as well, like we see in, in Lebanon. So all of that is reason for pessimism. All of that is reason to think uh, that our experiment may go wrong and to recognize just how terrible the consequences would be if the experiment does go wrong. But just as an easy optimism can turn into pessimism, I think that pessimism can turn into optimism. What I mean by this is that when your starting point is, this should all be easy. And when you look at the real injustices that actually exist in society today, um, it becomes very easy to be pessimistic and to say that there must be something uniquely bad about us if we're not able to sustain this relatively easy task of keeping the peace, of being tolerant towards each other. By the same token, I think that if you understand all of the mechanisms which make building these diverse democracies so difficult, and if you see how terribly wrong diverse societies have often gone in the history of the world, you can actually look at the present reality uh, in democracies from France and Germany to the United States and say, uh, there's actually a lot that is going better than people say. And so I'm struck at the moment by a very strange fashionable pessimism, which is driven by the far right, but which is often echoed in its own way by the mainstream and the left. So what you often hear on the far right about the current state of our societies is that uh, the strength derives from 
uh, certainly the culture and perhaps the ethnicity of a majority group, and that uh, immigrants who are coming into the country today uh, are, are subverting both of them uh, because they are certainly culturally and perhaps even in some way biologically inferior. That's the point that's uh, often pressed on the far right. And you hear that uh, in different contexts in France, the United States, and, and elsewhere. Now, on the mainstream and on the left, you often get the response to say that that uh, is, of course, uh, wrong. Uh, and insofar as it implies some kind of inferiority to immigrants bigoted. Uh, and I, I obviously share that assessment. Um, uh, but then there's a kind of strange pessimism that gets echoed, uh, where it is said, look, it's true that immigrants from these various countries aren't integrating fully and that um, uh, they're very poor and uh, that they're isolated and uh, uh, that they're not making economic progress, that they're not making educational progress. Uh, but the reason for that actually uh, is that our societies are so unjust and so discriminatory that they uh, don't get the same chance to integrate. So whereas the far right might say people from El Salvador and Mexico aren't succeeding like Irish and Italian immigrants did a century ago because there's something wrong with them, a lot of the mainstream and the left is going to say, yes, immigrants from Mexico and El Salvador aren't succeeding in the way that Italian and Irish immigrants did 100 years ago, but that's because not being white, they don't have the same opportunities to succeed in America as uh, white immigrants like Irish and Italian did a century ago. So I, I took all of those arguments seriously and looked at them with an open mind um, and tried to measure them against the actual empirical reality. Uh, and what I found was, was interesting because I think the picture which emerges is much more optimistic than what people say. Uh, that's the case on the point of language, for example, where the right claims or far right claims that people aren't learning the language and parts of the left claim that they shouldn't learn the language, that something like a common language is not necessary in the United States. Well, the sociological reality is that people in the first generation who often come here as adults, often with limited education, uh, do often struggle to learn the language well or fluently. That children, in nearly all cases, prefer speaking English to Spanish or Mandarin or whatever the language of the parents uh, might be. They're usually uh, reasonably competent in their uh, parents' language because they speak it at home, or at least they're spoken to in that language at home. But when they are with their siblings, with their relatives, uh, same age relatives, with their peers, they nearly always prefer to speak in English. And by the third generation, by the generation of the grandchildren, only about 1% of people still retain any level of mastery in the original language. So the idea that people aren't integrating on that count simply is not borne out by sociological reality. And the same, by the way, is true when you look at things like uh, socioeconomic progress. Uh, so um, uh, the, um, uh, in France, for example, and in Germany and in most European countries, uh, uh, it is true, again, that the first generation does not reach uh, median wages. This is unsurprising given the educational disadvantages that they usually suffered uh, in the places of origin. But the children, the grandchildren actually are more likely to gain a higher degree, to gain a better job, to earn more money than the children and grandchildren of similarly situated uh, native-born uh, uh, parents. Uh, so again, the socioeconomic progress is really fast. And in the United States, it turns out that progress among uh, immigrants today from just about any country, from El Salvador and Mexico and Vietnam and Zimbabwe and others, uh, is uh, taking place at, uh, interestingly, pretty much exactly the same speed as that of Italian or Irish immigrants 100 years ago. Uh, so that proves uh, that there's nothing inferior about these immigrants, but it also shows uh, that uh, despite the real existence of injustice and discrimination, uh, those forces are not strong enough uh, to actually uh, impede very, very real progress uh, among immigrant groups. Um, the most obvious uh, case that people press 
against this optimism is uh, the condition of African Americans in the United States. Uh, and it is certainly true that uh, African Americans suffer in a very serious way from the long term consequences of the forms of domination that they've suffered in this country for a very long time. And that, that continues to shape the outcomes we see uh, on wages and especially on wealth. Uh, but there too, I think it's important to have a more nuanced image than is sometimes presented by this odd coalition of pessimists we see on both sides of the political spectrum. So Donald Trump said in 2016, uh, talking to black voters, um, uh, you have no jobs, your schools are terrible, uh, your neighborhoods are really dangerous, vote for me, what the hell do you have to lose? And there's a lot of outrage about that, but when you look at a lot of the mainstream media and a lot of uh, academia uh, and a lot of left activism, the image that people are painting of a condition of Black America is actually similarly dystopian. Uh, well, the truth is that we do have a significant uh, percentage of African Americans who suffer deep and compounded disadvantages in, in neighborhoods that offer very little opportunity. But that is not the condition of a median African American today. So actually, uh, the median African American today um, is middle class, uh, lives in a suburb rather than uh, an urban neighborhood or, or, or a distant rural neighborhood, um, has a white collar job, uh, has, if uh, he or she is under the age of 40, uh, completed uh, some years of higher education in a community college or research university, um, is more likely to get the health insurance from an employer sponsored plan than to have to buy it on the open market or to be uninsured. Uh, and all of this actually translates into an optimism uh, among minority groups, which is rarely visible uh, in the mainstream discourse. So interestingly, uh, uh, many uh, minority groups, including Latinos, but also including African Americans, are more optimistic about the future of the United States and say in high numbers that they believe in the American dream than white Americans do. And that is not something that you would guess from representations in the wider culture. So on the basis of uh, that careful optimism, uh, we can ask about uh, the kind of vision for a society that we should create together. And my starting point here is that uh, we actually need to develop a vision of a society in which most people from whichever group they may be uh, coming would be excited to, to live. Um, uh, and there's a whole bunch of different things I say about that in the book, but let me just emphasize three points which might be particularly interesting among this audience. Uh, so the first is a defense for a philosophically liberal account of the relationship between the state, the group, and the individual, uh, which includes a, a rejection of the communitarian uh, alternative. Um, so the way I think about this, we need to uh, grant people two freedoms. We need to grant them the classic uh, freedoms uh, against a potentially tyrannical state and against the tyranny of a majority. We need to ensure that people in a free society and a diverse democracy are able to state unpopular opinions, that they are able to worship uh, 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 in a way that the majority may disapprove of uh, without having to worry about being locked up in jail or having to worry about uh, uh, a mob of people coming around to the house or having to worry about suffering undue disadvantages uh, uh, and forms of recrimination in other ways. Um, but we also need to provide them with a second kind of liberty, which is really important. Uh, and that is that uh, historically, the ways in which people have been unfree uh, have not just been at the hands of a state, have not just been at the hands of an outgroup which oppresses you. They have actually been, as Dan Asimoglu and James Robinson argue very nicely in their latest book, The Narrow Corridor, uh, in what they call a cage of norms. 
uh, in uh, the rules that your own parents, your own community, your own neighbors, uh, your own uh, priest or rabbi or imam uh, might set for you in the punishments uh, you might suffer uh, from your own group. And many people still do suffer from their own groups today. If, for example, they uh, grow up in a fundamentalist Christian family and they happen to be gay, or in some cases, if they uh, uh, grow up in a fundamentalist uh, Muslim family and they want to date freely uh, once they uh, turn 18. Um, and so we also need the freedom from uh, uh, those forms of uh, subjugation by your own group. And so this to me is what communitarians cannot provide because when you think about society as, as Lord Parak, uh, the British uh, philosopher has put it, an association of associations, uh, you might be able to protect the rights of unpopular minorities against the state, but you're not going to have a justification for ensuring that those groups in turn do not oppress their own members. And in fact, liberals, I think, can have a coherent response to the classic communitarian charge that they are uh, unable to give due importance to uh, religion and to the family ties that most people are born with. So if you uh, defend a political rather than a comprehensive liberalism, uh, you are able to recognize the deep importance that groups will always play in the lives of most people. Uh, that in fact is why the freedom of association and freedom of worship are classic liberal rights. You are perfectly able to recognize that most people don't choose the court course through life ab nihilo at the age of 18. Most people will continue to remain members of the communities into which they were born and to uphold the kinds of duties that they have been raised with towards their kin and towards their family. But those who do choose to leave their communities are able to do that. And so a liberal society respects groups derivatively from the rights and obligations of individuals because citizens in that society freely choose to invest groups with, uh, with meaning and freely remain members of them and could leave if they so choose. Um, the second question is, if this sort of settles some of the basic legal questions of uh, how you run a diverse society, there's still a question about how much commonality uh, we, we could or should hope for, uh, about the extent to which we should expect uh, immigrants to integrate, about uh, the extent to which we should assume that there's going to be different kinds of groups in the society for a long time. And there, there has been a long debate between two different guiding metaphors, uh, both of which I think are insufficient. So the first is the idea of a melting pot which actually, if you go to read, which I highly recommend, the play by Israel Zangweiler, um, who came up with this idea, which many people really should not appear to have done, has a really uh, uh, normatively powerful ambition. The, the play from which this term derives tells the story of a Jewish uh, immigrant and refugee to the United States at the turn of the last century who uh, falls in love with the daughter of a Russian baron uh, and wants to become a great composer, creating for the first time the sound of a new American man who has left the squabbles of the old world behind uh, to uh, make the new American man. Um, but when her father comes to stop her from marrying a Jew, he recognizes him as the general who oversaw the troops that killed his own family, and he breaks off the engagement. Uh, but the dramatic arc of the play is that at the end of it, he actually recognizes that he's failing to live up to his own standards, uh, and that he does have to marry her, that he uh, needs to be able to overcome the legacy of the old world. So the melting pot in its origin is not an ahistorical notion that is unaware of intergroup conflict or unaware of the deep suffering in the world, and yet the way it has often been used 
asks people uh, uh, too much uh, homogeneity. It requires them to give up the membership in their group too much. The metaphor suggests that for the resulting product may bear the mark of a lot of different influences. Um, everybody in it is going to be very homogeneous, very similar to each other, that there will not be a sustained difference between those different groups. And that I think um, is asking people too much and it has an impoverished vision of what a country might then look like. Now the alternative that has often been formulated to the melting pot is the idea of the salad bowl, is the idea of a mosaic. Uh, but that I think asks too little commonality. It assumes that there's going to be what Germans call Parallelgesellschaften, societies that live in parallel to such an extent that they will find it hard to sustain mutual solidarity, that they will find it hard to sustain a functioning welfare state, uh, that they will make it difficult for people who want to leave their communities to be able to do that. Uh, and that at the extreme, I do think uh, they will uh, uh, raise the risk of conflict and perhaps even civil war down the line. And so what I suggest in the book is a new metaphor, and I'm not 100% happy with it, but I think it sort of helps to express the kind of society uh, that would be appealing. And that's that of a public park. The idea being that all of us could, if we were in the same place, go to um, you know, Cambridge Common or some other public park uh, together after this presentation and chat among ourselves and say, we don't want to meet any new people. We are hermetically sealed off. But we might also run into other people and uh, forge new friendship. Um, we might also encounter uh, people uh, who, who, who stem from outside our own group. And uh, though it is the free choice of each person in a park to remain among their own party or to open themselves up in that way, uh, we can have a, a preference for the kind of park we want to build. Uh, for everybody in the park should be free to stay among themselves and it's perfectly fine for some or perhaps even a lot of people to do so, uh, there will be a problem if nobody ever encounters somebody new, new, if there's no dynamism at all, if people don't open themselves up uh, to their fellow citizens at all. And that I think explains nicely the amount of commonality we might uh, want to uh, pursue in a diverse democracy. It's fine for there to be some groups that are relatively hermetically sealed. It's fine for there to be many individuals who choose not to venture far out from their communities, but we need a critical mass of people who do engage with each other across the boundaries of religion or ethnicity, uh, or else we're going to be in trouble. Um, and the third kind of conceptual contribution I try to make here uh, is uh, a defense of patriotism. Now, um, uh, there's nothing that original about the defense of patriotism in itself. Uh, the case for why that can be an important uh, motivator of solidarity has been made, uh, you know, by by, by uh, Republican and other theorists for a very long time. Uh, uh, one of the ones that I find particularly moving uh, is by George Orwell. Uh, who in the middle of World War II uh, sat down to write in defense of patriotism, which might seem uh, like a surprising choice. But as he pointed out, if British intellectuals had succeeded in the project of uh, uh, freeing Brits from uh, patriotism, then the men of the SS might be patrolling the streets of London at the time he's writing, when London may not have been able to withhold the Blitz. And I think we're seeing uh, the inspiring power of patriotism today in the millions of uh, Ukrainians who are choosing to risk their lives uh, to withstand Putin's invasion. Um, but of course, the question of patriotism is always, um, what notion of it can uh, mobilize its positive potential uh, without all of the attendant risks? Because Putin too would claim to be a patriot. Uh, and so I discussed two um, well-trodden conceptions of patriotism and one that uh, has been discussed a, a, a little as often in that form and that I'm trying to put forward as a one part of a solution. So the first is ethnic 
nationalism. Uh, and that's something that for relatively an interesting reason uh, I reject. Um, uh, I don't think that the sheer fact of sharing a common descent has deep normative significance. I worry that ethnic nationalism is more likely than other forms of patriotism to uh, license uh, uh, aggression. Uh, because uh, uh, if I believe that there's something special about my ethnicity and you believe there's something special about your ethnicity, I might nevertheless feel uh, empowered to attack you. So it's not a stable uh, equilibrium. Uh, and it's also interestingly, uh, empirically, no longer a very convincing account of how most people actually feel. So what I mean by that is that uh, most Americans certainly recognize that they have many fellow citizens who do not share the same ethnicity. Uh, but at this point, so do most Western Europeans, whereas 40 or 30 years ago, they might have said that a true uh, Italian, Swede, Greek uh, needs to descend from the same people. Uh, that is now, according to a number of surveys, the minority answer. Most people say, no, of course, I can have fellow citizens who have a different ethnicity as long as they've been living here and speak the language and uh, fulfill a number of other not ethnically based criteria. Now, the traditional answer, if you reject ethnic nationalism, is to say uh, we should be civic patriots, we should be constitutional patriots. Uh, we should base our love of country on a common creed and a set of shared values. Um, uh, as somebody who has since leaving the government department become a, a proud American citizen, as somebody who five years ago was uh, uh, very happy to swear to defend the constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, uh, and as somebody who loves political theory, um, civic patriotism of course speaks to me. Um, and, and, and I do think that it is an important element uh, of a healthy patriotic conception. It is in part what can explain why those Russians who have been protesting the war at great risk to themselves are true patriots, uh, because they are saying not in our name, not the name, uh, not in the name of our nation. Um, civic patriotism has a limiting principle built in, which is saying 100% my nation, but not when my nation is being unjust at that moment, protest against uh, uh, the actions of our leaders is in fact the most patriotic course to take. But I have two worries about patriotism, one more philosophical and one more empirical. The philosophical concern is that if you assume that the nature of patriotism really is uh, the commitment to a shared set of values or principles, then it becomes very difficult to explain uh, what makes patriotism the love of a particular country. Uh, because actually, the constitutions and values of many different uh, democratic republics today are pretty similar to each other. Uh, and uh, those among you who think of themselves as American patriots would not suddenly become Austrian or Australian patriots if one of those countries decided to uh, implement the American constitution word for word. So I think that there is a partiality to patriotism which is insufficiently expressed by the civic patriotic tradition. Now, the second objection is, is, is much simpler and it is empirical. And it's simply that most people don't care that much about politics. That when most people say, uh, I love America, uh, they're not thinking about the Declaration of Independence, and they're not thinking about the Constitution, and they probably can't tell you what's in the 8th or the 11th Amendment. Um, and so I want to suggest a complement to the civic patriotic tradition. And that's a form of cultural patriotism. Now, uh, that uh, may and will draw on uh, some of the more positive aspects of a country's history and traditions, and that's perfectly fine. But it is on the whole a much more, much as highfalutin a much more everyday conception of what the culture of a country consists in. So I think when most people say that they love America uh, or some other country, what they mean is that they love its cities and its landscapes, its sights and sounds, its smells, its cultural scripts, the ways that govern how we interact each other on you know, this Zoom call and, and other kinds of contexts. 
um, even its celebrities and its TikTok stars and so on. Uh, and that culture, I think, uh, already bears the mark of the influence of uh, immigrants from many different parts of the world, of different kinds of ethnic groups. Uh, and even though, uh, in my experience, Americans in particular often say, we're such a diverse country, we have nothing in common. Uh, it is very apparent to any immigrant of a country like me. The United States is very different uh, from Germany and Italy and France, where I've lived. It's also very different from other Anglo-Saxon uh, countries like the United Kingdom. Uh, and perhaps it sometimes takes stepping out of a country to remember or recognize that. Uh, but I do think that it is that shared overlapping set of everyday cultures uh, which uh, explains the affection that a lot of people have for their country. Uh, and that is a good thing, particularly in a diverse democracy in which we need to complement the attachments that people always have to their own group, always will have to their own religious community with one set uh, of common aspirations, which also allow us to have solidarity um, and a sense of fellow citizenship, uh, which goes above uh, those subnational groups. Um, I could go on with all kinds of parts of the books, but I haven't been able to touch on. Um, but perhaps we'll get to those in the in the Q and A. So, so let me just close on on this. Um, the history of diverse societies should make us very aware that what I call the great experiment could easily go wrong. In history, there have been many societies in which uh, different ethnic and religious groups have managed to coexist together more or less peacefully for long stretches of time, sometimes for decades, sometimes for centuries, and then something went wrong and they uh, 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 disintegrated in the most terrible and violent ways. And we cannot exclude that as a possibility for the future of the United States, for the future of um, Italy, for the future of uh, Australia or other democracies today. <clears throat> um, but I also think that by comparison to those societies, we are actually doing uh, reasonably well today, but we've made real progress for the last decades that we can build on. And the most importantly, that in order to avoid that prospect, uh, we need to also be capable of communicating the strengths of our society. We need to be able to offer our fellow citizens a vision of a kind of society in which we'd actually be excited to live in. Um, that I think gets far too short shrift um, uh, in our academic and broader intellectual culture today. Um, and, and that's what I've tried to offer in this book. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Um, Manuel, you can start it off. I, I uh, thank you uh, for the talk. I, I, uh, I, I, I feel the, uh, uh, the analogy with the public park is, uh, is uh, very inspiring. Uh, I am uh, reminded of Jefferson's remark on something like uh, this, where he said the in essence, the trees in this public park have to be fed with the blood of tyrants. Uh, uh, meaning, uh, uh, if one looks at the uh, uh, you know, current events with Ukraine, uh, it, it does seem like the uh, Putin has been very helpful in restoring uh, uh, a dedication to liberty in Europe and unity. Even the Germans seem to be uh, riled up a bit to. Uh, uh, help Ukraine, uh, Switzerland uh, leaving a bit its neutrality. Uh, uh, there's a sense, there's, it's invigorating a sense of purpose in, in this uh, 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 invasion. And even in Ukraine, I have uh, friends in Kharkiv, for instance, which I voted for the pro-Russian party. Uh, those people all now hate Putin. They're all united uh, for liberty. And, and so, uh, so this kind of intense uh, 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 affront and injustice unites people together. 
and creates a kind of uh, nationalism, a reminder uh, of the difference between uh, free countries and, and, and tyrannical countries. So, so I, I wonder in the absence of that, so in the absence of an illiberal enemy, if the whole world, let's say, it had, had one stream and, and, and the whole world was liberal democracies, uh, would it really uh, have any chance of holding together? Because I think we see, uh, for instance, in, in the United States and Europe, when you have prolonged periods of peace, doesn't that also mean a uh, prolonged uh, uh, increase uh, in disunity, in uh, increase in uh, envy, complaints, divisions, uh, 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 that the, the focus starts to be turned inward and against each other and groups hate each other uh, uh, rather than hate this common enemy. Now, uh, uh, you know, one can say the older solution to this problem, I, I think, was to have a, 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 a stronger repressive internal check. Religion used to be stronger. Uh, there was more awareness that education had to be the uh, inculcation of the values of the class, the classes you depended on to govern the country, like you know, middle class values and so forth, uh, 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 to, to be in charge and, 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 and educate. So if one went fully to the model of the public park and the liberal theory, uh, would there really be enough of that, uh, uh, I hate to use the word fear, but, uh, but, 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 but certainly something stronger, something uh, more repressive, a certain repressive element needed to, to keep things together and going. Um, yeah, look, I think obviously having an external enemy makes things easier. Um, you know, I'm sometimes asked the talks, uh, what it would take for all of humanity to unite. Uh, and my answer is always, uh, you know, a credible threat of alien invasion. Um, you know, that might be the one thing that unites all humans, but only at the price of, uh, you know, existential conflict with, you know, Martians or whatever it may be. Um, so, so I certainly think that uh, one of the reasons why American society was uh, felt relatively cohesive for parts of the Cold War and one of the reasons why uh, it has come to feel a lot less cohesive uh, over the last decades um, is, uh, you know, the extent to which there is or isn't a sense of external threat. Um, but but I, I wouldn't want to think, and, and so in a way, uh, perhaps the good news is, I say somewhat cynically, that we're going to have an external threat, right? I do think that we are at a stage at which um, democracies are very embattled. Uh, they have lost a lot of their self-confidence for perhaps their awakening from a slumber a little bit. Um, and uh, autocratic countries have been uh, re, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Reassembling themselves and uh, gaining in confidence uh, in a way that people have overlooked. I mean, we fought often over the couple, last couple of decades as a, as a crisis of democracy. Uh, I teach a class called the crisis of democracy. Um, but in many ways, the last decade has also been an autocratic resurgence. Uh, which is in part related, but also in part independent. Um, and so, uh, you know, the quote with good news perhaps is that we're going to be facing serious external threats from Russia and uh, uh, potentially from China in, in the next decades. Uh, and that perhaps will help to inspire a little bit of commonality. Um, but I want to base my ideas or my, 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 my vision for diverse society on something a little bit uh, uh, other than, than that kind of cynicism. And I do think that while it is harder to sustain uh, a, a real commonality of spirit without the kind of external threat, it is possible. Um, and I do think that uh, that cultural patriotism, for example, goes deeper than most people think. It's not something that's visible in everyday life, but it does provide a real kit and a real glue for the society. Um, uh, there are actually, uh, for a country the size of the United States, um, very few secessionary movements here. Um, uh, even for people uh, uh, are deeply aware of the cultural differences, uh, there's also more and more friendship and uh, more and more businesses, uh, small businesses, more and more romantic relationships and marriages. Uh, 
across the boundaries of different ethnic and religious groups. Um, uh, you know, people who may dislike each other in one way or another uh, do cheer for the same team at the Olympics. Um, so I think even over these last few decades when American life has felt so uh, uh, centrifugal, uh, uh, there has actually been some real commonality of spirit and in some ways a deepening of commonality of spirit below the political level. And so, uh, so yeah, I guess external threat helps in a way that's good news because there's going to be lots more external threats in the decades to come, but I don't think that it's a necessary condition. Um, let me interject just a few things because of Manuel's question. I mean, the one trite observation is that in Ukraine, right, the men are forced to fight the women, leave the country with the children. These gender wars that we have here are a big part of this polarization which you didn't talk about you right you talked about race ethnicity those don't seem to be really the problems at least in the us it's much more political polarization that's like a second order problem some of these other things underlie them but ultimately not really i would say so um you know i mean this is that's a pretty obvious um uh, obvious observation that under these circumstances, the culture war issues that we suffer from more than anything fall away. And while you say mixed marriages are on the rise, that's true, but you know, marriage rates in general are completely down. So you could say that's a silver lining, but big picture, it's terrible. And also from what I read, um, Democrats and Republicans, especially Democrats are utterly loath for their children to marry a Republican or uh, like somebody from the other party. Like there, I, I think I think you painted a much nicer picture than it is and where the rubber meets the road, these things um, seem to be fairly unsoluble. But I just wanted to interject this. You can answer at some other point and we have um, Shep coming up next. Well, perhaps if you don't mind, I will I will quickly answer that and then, then I look forward to Shep's question. Um, so on marriage, look, I mean, I think there's, uh, uh, you know, uh, there may be some good reasons to, to want more people to get married, but I think the underlying point uh, is nevertheless an important one. I mean, uh, I believe until about 30 years ago, a majority of Americans thought that interracial marriage was uh, morally unacceptable. Uh, that is now down to the single digits. Um, and you might think that that's just sort of response bias, that people aren't too afraid to tell posts what they really think. Um, but the number of uh, uh, interracial children born in the United States has gone up precipitously. So it used to be about one in 33 until a few decades ago. It is now one in seven, or according to some statistics, one in six. Now, you might have a separate preference for those children to come from married couples rather than unmarried couples and across, across demographic categories, marriage is going down and so on, fine. But I don't think on the question of how we're dealing with diversity and the extent to which our society is integrating, um, uh, that is a check on the, on the optimism. Now, absolutely, when you talk about the political level, uh, I'm very concerned about this. And of course, my last book, The People versus Democracy, was making the point that a lot of the authoritarian populists who are rising in our politics um, uh, present a very serious danger to democracy, and that danger remains. Um, perhaps not everybody in this audience will agree, but I certainly think that if Donald Trump is reelected in 2024, that will present a very serious danger to uh, the American Republic. Um, and I think that some of the things that are going on in terms of politicization of a process of certifying elections and so on, are also uh, 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 causing a genuine danger of a constitutional crisis in 2024, 2028, that we should be very afraid of. Um, so that is one of the ways in which a great experiment could go wrong, and perhaps, perhaps will go wrong. Um, for me, one way of thinking about the society at the moment is that we have a kind of cultural civil war of the uh, political and intellectual elites. Uh, but actually, a lot of developments in the heart of society uh, are a lot more healthy. And one of the questions is whether uh, uh, the elites, which probably include all of us, um, are going to manage to impose their civil war on the rest of society, or whether the rest of society is going to be able uh, to, to avoid the imposition of that civil war. And part of the question, of course, is whether our, you know, Republican institutions will survive. Um, so, so many ways in which it can go wrong, uh, 
Uh, but I don't think it detracts from uh, the developments in the heart of society being relatively healthy. And one of my hopes is that if we recognize that the developments in the heart of society are actually much healthier than we've often seen, that is going to help us maintain the optimism we need to make sure that the dangers of Rotan populists don't win. Because when I look at a country like France and the strength of Marine Le Pen there, one of the reasons for that, I think, is that we haven't been able to counter her pessimism with uh, an optimistic narrative, but instead have echoed her pessimism in a way that's actually emboldened those people who are the to our institutions. Thank you. Shep. That's probably a good um, segue into my question. Um, I've been reading your new book and I've been reading other political science books like Don Horowitz's book on ethnic uh, conflict. And uh, I've also been reading a lot about um, critical race theory and anti-racism. And I'm struck by a couple of contrasts here. Um, one is that the good political science literature starts with the assumption, and I think strong, uh, strongly based, that tribalism creates an enormous difficulty for human societies and for liberal democracy. Um, the other is that there are some ways that we can um, engineer, adapt institutions and try to educate political uh, opinion to try to mitigate some of those difficulties. But what I, what I see in the, the literature, and I, I mentioned this because I think this is what is being taught to undergraduates more than anything else, is that number one, there's no inherent problem because there's no human nature, everything's a social construct, but that all governing is oppression. It's oppression by one group over another. So we really can't do anything about it. You know, institutions don't matter because it's just power. Um, so it strikes me that the most important, both pessimistic and optimistic views that you present um, are foreign to what is being taught um, under the under the uh, rubric of anti-racism or whatever you call it. So I was one, wondering what you could recommend of how we can do a better job educating students, both graduate students and undergraduates, about thinking more seriously about these things and that they are generally being taught. Uh, yeah, that's that's a really interesting way of framing it, and 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 I largely agree with you. I've been reading a lot of critical race theory as well because I'm actually trying to uh, write an intellectual history of, uh, for lack of a better word, left identitarianism, um, which has a really interesting history. It turns out, and I think uh, the ways in which it's been presented are often wrong, and actually, really, is not rooted in Marxism. Uh, it's rooted in postmodernism, but then ironically uh, inverts uh, over time a lot of the premises of postmodernism. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the interesting things about it is that it kind of enacts a lot of what Michel Foucault's nightmare would have been, even as it intellectually derives uh, in important ways from his work. So, so I think for the next book, I'll have a really interesting story to tell about where this, this ideology comes from, as well as, a, as well as a critique of it, because as you surmise from my book, I do think that it goes wrong in some important ways. Um, one of the places where I see that, by the way, uh, is uh, in what kind of pedagogical approaches even before the college level might be helpful, right? So if you take seriously the fact that there is a human nature uh, and that groupishness can inspire us to some of the greatest achievements of humanity, but it can also unfortunately inspire some of the greatest crimes of humanity, uh, then you really want to think very carefully about what kinds of groups do you want people to identify with and how do you set up institutions that don't turn that in-group identification into a danger? And the rough answer that I give is people in diverse society will always have their attachment to their religion, their attachment to their cultural group, and perhaps their attachment to their ethnic group to some extent. And that's fine. We're not going to be able to get rid of it, and it can have value too. But we need to also have bridging institutions in society, which makes sure that at the same time, they also have a form of national solidarity that allows people precisely stem from these different groups to say, hey, we have something in common. And we have to diffuse those conflicts. We have to try and get people to see that as one of the identities, but to realize that we also have other identities which are also important. Um, 
Now, what we see in a lot of elite private schools at the moment, for example, uh, Dalton and Horace Mann and New York and at several friends in DC and at some of the big schools in uh, Boston as well, I'm sure, is that you have a teacher coming in and taking kids at the age of 10 or eight or six and telling them, uh, we're gonna put you into an affinity group. And within that group, we're going to tell you uh, uh, you know, about the importance of your ethnic identity uh, in a political context. Um, uh, and that is rooted in a theory of strategic essentialism, which says, well, all of these ideas, of course, are uh, artificial and socially constructed, and these groups don't really have any significance. That's the sort of um, little remainder of postmodernism uh, uh, in the discourse. Um, but that's sort of just a verbal proviso because then the idea is because people have been discriminated against along the lines of those groups, uh, we should actually encourage them to identify with those groups. And so actually for all, for all practical purposes, we will treat your identity in an essentialist manner, right? So it's strategic essentialism because we strategically act as for the essentialist account of your identity where in fact true. And it is our job as educators to imbue that identity in you. Now, I think that that um, uh, uh, is dangerous uh, for any group, but it's particularly dangerous for whites. So the idea here is that you then take the white students and you tell them, you're white and that defines your standing in the society and you get these unfair advantages and privileges from it. And so once we've lectured you enough, you're going to become convinced anti-racists who fight against all of those injustices. But we already have a number of studies where that is not in fact the case. But for example, when you lecture people on white privilege, they then perform more uh, uh, discriminatory on an implicit association test. And everything we learn from uh, uh, group psychology is that once you tell people your most important identity is that you're white, they're going to say, well, so let me fight for the interests of whites. Let me fight for the interests of my group. And so, uh, uh, you know, I really worry about how we can go back to a pedagogy which, 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 which uh, is based, for example, on the insights of intergroup contact theory, which says you can reduce your prejudice to others, you can actually come, have more in common room, you can build solidarity, but only if we highlight your commonalities, if we put you in a context where you have common interests and fighting for the same goals, such as classic sports teams. Right? That's a really good way to say, hey, we're going to heighten you, the arbitrary difference between your sport team and the neighboring high school sport team, but the different people within it are going to build solidarity, are going to reduce prejudice towards each other. That's a much, much healthier pedagogical approach than those kinds of uh, affinity groups. So um, look, how do we get people at college level to read and assign the right things? I don't know. I mean, the best I can do is to make arguments against it, and that's what I'm going to try and do in my next book. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of richness in the, in, the, uh, in the tradition of critical race theory. When you read the actual writings by uh, Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw and so on, you, you understand where they're coming from and they're smart scholars making interesting points. But I do think that they are fundamentally anti-liberal and explicitly so. Um, and that the vision of uh, how to build a better society is one I don't share. And so I think we just have to, um, you know, make make our best, most most good faith arguments uh, for for where they went wrong, and try to put in place a better vision, and hope that over time, we convince not just the majority of our fellow citizens, who I think are on this side of the debate in any case, uh, but perhaps also a few academics. Thank you, um, Allison. Yeah, th thanks, Yasha, for a really stimulating talk. I have a. I have a comment and then two quick questions. And the comment is perhaps on a more optimistic note uh, regarding pedagogy in the classroom today. Uh, I did a very interesting experiment this fall that worked quite well. I taught the old fashioned version of American constitutional democracy. Uh, I don't know if that was around when you got your PhD, but it was you know when they blew it up and made a comparative and all these things that no longer made sense. I taught that to Middlebury students, and I just assigned Ibram X. Kendi stamped from the beginning alongside. So they're reading, you know, Mill, Tocqueville, all these things, the Supreme Court cases, and Kendi all the way through. And then I let them just decide what they wanted to talk about. 
for the most part. And what was really interesting is they will gravitate toward the classic texts, even students of color, once you acknowledge that this is the history, okay, this is America's original sin. You can read all about it, you can talk all about it, but they'd prefer to talk about the classic texts if you do it that way. So that was just one pedagogical idea. I think that we're quite well, just wanna throw that out there. My question for you kind of follows on Anna's point about um, cultural uh, patriotism. I'm, I just spent a lot of time in Latrobe, Pennsylvania and uh, Indiana, Milton, Indiana. And all I was struck by was, my God, we are two or three separate countries now. I mean, the people dress differently. They watch different TV programs. They listen to different music. Even Silicon Valley versus New York, I think there's two just drastically different cultures there. So I wanted to get you to elaborate on how cultural patriotism could unite us under these circumstances and what's wrong with good old fashioned civic patriotism? So that's one question. The second question is has to do with the public park metaphor, which I thought was really interesting. But then I started to think, you know, that really presupposes that we've got a clear distinction between the public and the private spheres. And in so many ways with big tech and social media, media that is precisely what is vanishing. The, and with privatization, the public space is just growing smaller and smaller. So how can the public park uh, vision flourish under those circumstances with big tech on the one hand where, you know, Americans are more consumers than citizens, which is part of the problem, but also with, um, with these other factors I've described. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, I, 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 yeah, it's, it's lovely to, 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 to see you. And these are great questions. Um, the, um, I share your optimism, actually, in some ways. Um, uh, you know, I found that a lot of students are afraid. Uh, so one of the things that, 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 that really saddens me is when I talk to undergrads and ask them whether they ever, you know, debate the world with their friends um, and debate politics, perhaps, with their friends. Mm -hmm. They say, well, you know, with my best friends behind closed doors, but never in the dining hall because, you know, you never know yeah. who he is what and is going to put it on Instagram or, or TikTok and, you know, claim that I said something that I didn't and so on. And that to me was very sad because having, you know, uh, wide ranging, raucous and earnest debates about the world was was one of the nicest things I, I did in college. And to think that yeah. students don't have that is really sad. But I, I think you also see, though, that most students uh, do want to have genuine debates in class uh, and they don't share my views on everything, but they actually are willing to be challenged and they're willing to uh, have wide ranging conversations. Um, there is, as in many institutions, uh, uh, a small number of students uh, or a small number of people uh, who want to shut those things down. Uh, and sometimes they succeed. Um, but this is really more a problem of collective action than it's a problem of mass preference. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to figure out how our institutions can uh, stop making people vulnerable, how our institutions can stand up uh, to those liberal forces. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not you know, us against the students or us against the young generation. Uh, it is in many ways empowering the young generation to do what they want, which is to, which is to have those real debates. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, every time that I've uh, assigned some stuff where I thought, oh my God, you know, are some students going to be offended by this? Or is it going to be... Yeah, he froze. I pushed back in an in a, in a honest way. Um, but, you know, uh, some people also have bad experiences because they happen to have a... Oh no, I can't hear him. Asha, you froze. So um, maybe once you come back, you'll repeat a bit of what you said and we'll edit this out. Power a little bit. Yasha, can you hear me? Yasha, can you hear me? Can you hear me? He had warned us that his internet might not be so good. Oh. It usually. Hello, goes. Harvey. Hi, hello, Alice. Good nice to see you. <laughs> you want to you want to expound on your point? Um, <laughs> on, on my point, um, which, which one? 
Yeah. <laughs> Fair point, sir. Yeah, so cool. he left. I think he's probably leaving and trying to come back. I bet he is. Yeah. No, but this this question of what to teach is 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 very interesting. I think, um, and we have these taboo topics. You know, we're being told that we're supposed to talk about race. We need to have these honest discussions about race, and if you try to have one, no one will talk. But I mean, you know, <laughs> Diana. It's really Schell, funny. <laughs> Diana Schell here is doing this, and she had some terrible problems in her class teaching both the classics and, you know, more modern people. It doesn't always go well. Yeah, <laughs> at least I, not today. This experiment went well. It's like they realized what where the you know it was becoming repetitive. The other text was becoming repetitive, and there was rich more richness in the the others the other offerings. Well, I'm going to, uh, next year, I'm going to teach a course that I call Debating Diversity, um, where I'm going to have uh, the most important uh, current readings by Kendi and Angelo and others, um, and then the leading critiques of them. So you have the mm -hmm. 1619 project, the 1776 project, and get them to argue about it. And if they don't want to, I'll force them to argue about it. And yeah. I'll tell you in a year how well that went. Oh, you want, know, you want a trick for that, Shep? Sure. Hi, Yasha. Hi, everyone. All right. So I've now dialed in. Oh, God, Yasha. <laughs> uh, let me see. Allison, I can always use tricks. So. No, no, I'll send it. To, I'll send you. Um, you have them debate it, but you assign them the position. So it's not they don't have to own what they're debating. Right. And then they no, and they. That. Yeah. All right, sorry about this. Um, my internet went away for a minute and then I was dialing on my phone, but now my real internet is back. So if, that, if, I, if totally I do it again, fine. I will dial back in on the, on the phone. Not a problem. Um, so you were out about a minute or so before. If you can recap some of the things that you were saying and then we can to edit. Allison, to yeah, to Alison. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I think I was in the middle of saying that most uh, that, that, that many students are afraid to uh, that they're afraid to to talk with their friends. Do you still get that? Um, yeah. And and yeah. So I think basically what what this is not a problem of mass preference. It's a problem of uh, uh, collective action. And I think what we need to think about is not how you know do we wise older people defend uh, against uh, the terrible preferences of a young generation of young students. It's how can our institutions ensure that the preference of a majority to have real debate mm -hmm. uh, is honored, uh, and that politely but firmly uh, we stop uh, those few who want to uh, make that impossible uh, from derailing um, uh, our pedagogical mission. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main thing that requires is uh, courage by institutional leaders, um, which uh, sadly appears to be lacking. And normally, when institutional leaders do have courage, um, they uh, uh, they're pretty good at it. Um, you know, I, I uh, the last thing uh, that a professor should ever do is to lord the university president. But I think that, that Ron Daniels, the, the president of Hopkins, is pretty good at that. He he's he's made clear that he will defend free speech, and I think that that makes a difference in the uh, atmosphere of the university. Yeah, Leon Botstein is pretty good at that too. I think. I have heard more mixed things about the state yeah. of Bart, but that's oh, that's too bad. <laughs> there's a number of big blowouts there, but um, mm -hmm. I think has been very good at stating his position, whether or not the institution has always followed through and it may be more complicated. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, you go ahead. Yeah. So, 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 um, uh, so those now I've only dealt with your preliminary comment, Alison, and then you had two questions. Yes. Uh, I think the first was about patriotism, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I found it very interesting uh, when, when I was teaching a student um, who uh, was, uh, I believe, undocumented, certainly her parents were undocumented, um, who uh, I think, uh, you know, came from, really from quite challenging socioeconomic circumstances. Uh, and I said something along those lines, and she said to me, you know, I don't really feel American, and, and I, I respect that, right? I mean, she doesn't have full standing in the society because she, she's been excluded from citizenship. Um, 
But the funny thing about it was that the, 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 the way in which she presented her objection is the exact way that students in America present an objection to their professor. Right, and the way she speaks without an accent, and the way she she carries herself, um, was deeply American. I, I said to her, "Look, I mean, as somebody who didn't grow up in this country, you read to me as completely American, and I think you probably read like that to most people." And you know, she listened to that with an open mind. Said, "Oh, that's interesting. That never occurred to me. Right? That's weird that people might see me that way, but I think it's true, actually. Right? So." Um, now, now, there are different cultures within the country, right? The, the culture of uh, rural Pennsylvania is different from the culture of New York City, and the culture of New York City is different from, from LA uh, or San Francisco, and, and that's certainly the case. I just think uh, all of those cultures are still more similar to each other than, than a culture in Britain. And I don't quite buy that argument about the cosmopolitan elites, you know, um, who, you know, all of the people who are making decisions could live anywhere. Most of them couldn't, but, you know, most of them would be happy to go live anywhere for two or three years, but actually even they still feel much more comfortable, much more rooted in the country. And the number of true itinerants like me is actually very, very low. Um, and so I just think that in, in all kinds of uh, uh, complicated and sometimes surprising ways, the power of these cultural scripts uh, uh, remains, remains deep. Now, I don't think that's enough to say uh, you know, I'm going to have respect for the president if I disagree with him politically, right? There's certain kinds of things that it's not going to do for us. Um, but, but I do think that the cultural commonality actually goes deep. Um, and then I think the third question, um, I, I might have to ask you to say a couple more words because I agree with you about the blurred boundary between the public and the private. I'm not sure how much of a problem that is for the metaphor. I realize that the public park is a sort of metaphor that has the word public in it. Um, but sort of just as a vision for, you know, you can be an Amish and, you know, be friendly to neighbors or whatever, but basically say, I'm not going to do very much other than outside the Amish community. Um, or you can be somebody who is in contact with people from lots of different cultures. And all that's important is that we have a kind of critical mass of connectors. Um, I don't know how exactly the blurred boundary between public and private uh, makes that point more complicated. Can I say just a, a lot of questions? So I don't know if I'm allowed to say more. Yeah, Anna, yes, yes. I probably Go should ahead. shut up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, what I'm, I was trying to make there, and I have a piece I can send you that I've written is there's, there's this tension between what we want as consumers and what we need as citizens in this com uh, country. So these big tech companies, we're volunteering all this information to them. The product is free, but if the product is free, it means that you're the product. So they have enormous information about who we are and what we do, and there's nothing in the Constitution to protect us against corporate infringements on the, for, on the right to privacy. So in that sense, it's almost like our own private lives are being commodified. And similarly, much of the work of government today is done by contractors. So it's privatized. The public sphere is just really shrinking. Some people would say it exists on Twitter, but then these companies made the arbitrary decision to silence a standing US president. So I just think the public sphere is is in danger. You so know, I agree with all of that. I, I just yeah. don't think that that undermines the usefulness of this particular metaphor. But but I agree yeah. that, that all of those are problems that we need to deal with. Yeah. OK. So to make the metaphor work, we need to deal with those problems. Well, the metaphor is not going to solve all of our problems, but I, I would see those problems as unconnected to the metaphor, if that makes sense. OK. So Harvey had a question, and then we have at least three more questions. Um, the notion of a black community, uh, to, to what extent is, is, it, is it good to speak of a black community? And um, if, if, if that's good, why is it, um, uh, as it seems to be very bad to speak of the white community? Uh, or the general <laughs> question would be, what, what, when is it good for ethnic groups to be communities? Yeah, um, 
Well, so I think that we should be much more careful about our usage of all of these terms. So I have a whole chapter, which I didn't really tease in my talk, uh, which is talking about the most dangerous idea in American politics. And the most dangerous idea in American politics, I think, is uh, the idea that America will be majority minority by 2045 and the associated idea of this rising or inevitable demographic majority for Democrats. Um, I think the thing is politically because it leads the left to bad forms of electoral triumphalism where they think we just need to mobilize our own people and then we'll win every election. And it led NPR and the New York Times to say that Donald Trump could never win in 2016 for purely demographic reasons, which obviously turned out to be wrong. Um, it also drives a lot of the most uh, dangerous demographic panic on the right. When you look at Michael Anton's 2016 essay, The Flight 93 Election, the, the empirical premise of that is the rising democratic majority. Um, you know, he claims that it's, I quote, because of a ceaseless importation of third world foreigners, end quote, uh, that uh, the Republican Party and the Republic is going to be screwed and that you need to uh, put Trump into the cockpit even if he doesn't know how to fly it, right? Um, but, but beyond the <clears throat> political element or the electoral element, I think this is a really bad and dangerous way to think about the nature of a country. Um, uh, uh, it is not clear to me that people of color is a coherent category. To think that somebody who might have, you know, French, <clears throat> or let's say, you know, Belgian aristocratic heritage on one side and Indian Brahmin heritage on the other side, which is to say, being at the top of two different uh, 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 social hierarchies for hundreds of thousands of years, um, uh, and then they grow up in the United States, I'm sure that perhaps because of the color of their skin, they may experience certain disadvantages and so on. I don't want to minimize that. But I think that that person somehow is naturally a part of the same group as people whose ancestors have all been enslaved in the United States seems to me to just be a form of voodoo. I mean, that's just, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a belief in, in a really dangerous racial metaphysical thinking uh, which just doesn't make sense. Uh, and actually, when you look at how people self-identify, uh, you see that is not the case. Uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, Hispanics do not think of themselves as a coherent group. Um, uh, a, a lot of Hispanics think of themselves as white rather than as people of color. Um, uh, there's a rapidly growing number of mixed race people in this country. It's not at all clear that Asian Americans are going to be on the same uh, electoral or other side uh, as African Americans on average. Uh, you see, of course, in the 2020 election that Trump was competitive um, because uh, he increased his share of the vote among uh, African Americans and Asian Americans and uh, especially Latinos, whereas Biden won because he increased his share of the vote relative to Hillary Clinton among white Americans. So, so I, I actually want to sort of really be careful about this whole discourse, right? Now, I do think that there is a way in which certain specific experiences of injustice and suffering can give rise to group solidarity uh, and group identity in, in a meaningful way. Uh, and I think Tommy Shelby uh, at Harvard has a good uh, uh, book on that. Uh, and I think that is true uh, in a special way of many African-Americans in the United States. But interestingly, I don't think it is true of a, a significant portion of a black population in the United States now, which consists of relatively recent immigrants uh, of often H1B holders from, from Kenya and Nigeria and other places. Um, so, so I would say there is, uh, in, in an odd way, for I'm not generally sympathetic to it, I think that the American descendants of slavery, ADOS, a sort of radical activist group, um, has a point to make uh, when it says, for example, that it's very strange uh, in affirmative action uh, that 50% you know, of the places at many Ivy League schools are given to often wonderful and very talented descendants of recent immigrants from, from African nations, uh, you know, as a kind of quasi form of reparation for the very real injustice done to a completely different group, which is those who have suffered uh, uh, chattel slavery in the United States and their descendants. Um, so uh, 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 I'm not gonna give you a general answer, I, but I do think there's a special form of solidarity among African-Americans that I think we can, we can respect and value. 
while being very skeptical and critical of uh, the unthinking way um, in which we talk about the subject more broadly. And for anybody who's not read the wonderful book by Karen Barbara Fields called Racecraft, um, uh, I highly recommend it because it really pushes that point very, very, very smartly. Okay, I'm gonna make use of my discretionary powers and call on Heather Wilford, the head of the three guys. Heather, you're the expert, I wanna hear you. Oh, I don't know about that, um, uh, but thank you for this talk. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask a question about economics and economic inequality, how much that is something um, that makes diverse democracies more difficult. Do you see where where might that factor into your view here or or are economic questions uh, different separate concerns um, yeah. to the to the project of making diverse democracy possible or sustainable? Yeah. So what I would say is <clears throat> a couple of things. The first is it's very important to have a right economic background conditions. Um, much easier to sustain diverse democracies when you have general economic growth that actually arrives in the pocketbooks of most people. Um, uh, you know, much easier to be friendly to towards your neighbor um, who might have moved in and bought the nicer house and have a nicer car and come from a different uh, group when you're feeling pretty satisfied with your own life. Much harder to do so when you feel like the world is somehow not giving you what you deserve. And why is this guy coming in over there and his life seems to be better than me? Um, that obviously activates uh, outgroup discrimination and fears uh, in a much more uh, radical way. Um, the second thing I would say is that <clears throat> I think you need to have a sustained real optimism among uh, 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 immigrant minority groups, uh, among historically disfavored groups, that they can make real progress. But this is not just an abstract promise but that actually things are improving. Otherwise, uh, uh, you're going to get a lot more resentment and a lot more skepticism about the rules of a mainstream society. That's, I think, why it's important to both note that African-Americans and other groups in the United States are actually quite optimistic, uh, and that despite some really persistent problems that are, that are, that are hard to solve, um, uh, 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 things are far from the dystopia that so many people uh, portray it as being. Um, I think what you do have to resist is uh, 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 the attempt to engineer an equality of outcome, uh, especially over the short term. I think we will get to an equality of uh, outcome uh, by demographic group over a very long period, but, but it is a long period. Um, uh, and most attempts uh, to engineer that in the short term, I think, are both doomed to fail uh, and uh, uh, likely to inflame the kind of intergroup competition uh, which is liable to tear society apart. Um, and there have been some real missteps on that. I mean, this is less on the economic front than on some other kinds of things. Um, but, you know, when I look at the uh, New York State Health Department uh, saying uh, a few months ago, uh, at a time when there was very good over the counter. Um, uh, uh, drugs available that make, uh, 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 it's not over-counter, sorry, but, but you know, simple pills you can take to really reduce mortality from COVID, but they weren't available in great numbers yet. So there was some form of rationing that was going on. Um, and when the New York, Health, New York State Health Department basically said, you can take this if you have serious pre-existing conditions or if you're non-white. Uh, that is something that is both normatively unacceptable um, and I think politically absolutely toxic. Um, uh, so yeah, I think sustain real economic growth, make sure that it really is inclusive economic growth, uh, that members of all groups feel like we really can get ahead and there are many members of our community that are getting ahead, um, but, but don't follow, but, but insist on a universal set of institutions, including you know, universal welfare state, rather than um, uh, race conscious and race sensitive policies in areas where they're inappropriate and politically deeply fraught. All right, Avi, keep it snappy. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, with regard, you talked about the optimism in the country and it's not being told. It's an indictment of the media as well as the universities and talk about what, what and how is being taught at the college level 
I think they have now deteriorated to being in, in the business of indoctrination rather than in, in the business of education. Your theory about groupism is obviously well taken. It goes up from the small to the large. You root for your family versus the neighbor. You root for your high school versus the adjacent high school. You root for the Red Sox versus the Yankees and for the U.S. in the Olympics. But if there's a dark side to it. I'm not a, a particularly fervent basketball fan, but I know Kyrie Irving, who played for the Celtics two, for two years, just a couple of years ago, and was cheered, now playing for Brooklyn, and the fans were vicious in terms of their assault on him simply because he had moved to a, a different group. I, I very much applaud your most recent comment, the last comment you made about passing laws, and that, that leads me, to, I think, to the main point in question. Your metaphor of the park was really presumed on a voluntary model but people could go and interact with others if they choose and not if they don't choose. The history of ethnic groups in this country who came and were subject to intense discrimination, Irish need not apply, discrimination against Italians, anti-Semitism, they all overcame it without the passage of affirmative action laws and other mandatory requirements by government. You pointed out, with, and I'm glad you did, about the, the New York State Health Department, because I was also uh, offended by that. I think I wonder whether the best bet here is to have minimal protections by the government. Uh, in effect, the implementation of the First Amendment and things like that, but not some of these more draconian measures, such as we're going to give preference to one ethnic group than over another. And I would also add, look at how the left views the black community. They are outraged if they find a black conservative that is in, in the public sphere. They've been vicious to Clarence Thomas and dismissive. They you know, call Uncle Tom. If any black person enunciates views other than what is in keeping with the left-wing perspective of the Black community. I think that is part of the toxism. That's why I come back to, I think, a minimalist approach in terms of protection from government, from laws, is our best bet. Um, so, so just on the, on the question of race consciousness and race, race sensitive policy, um, in general, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of a constitutionalization of moral questions in the United States. So I don't think, for example, that whether or not we should engage in uh, capital punishment should depend on whether or not it constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. I just think that's not a very helpful way of puzzling through this issue morally. <laughs> um, in this particular case, I actually think that the American jurisprudential tradition has come up with the right set of standards, which is that... Uh, uh, there is um, the Equal Protection uh, uh, Clause, which um, provides a very strong presumption against the state taking account the ethnicity uh, of uh, somebody in how it acts. Um, there are, as is the case of all rights, uh, certain cases in which that can be overridden when there's a compelling state interest. Uh, but uh, the measures that need to be taken in those circumstances have to be very narrowly tailored uh, and uh, directly serve that compelling state interest uh, uh, after an exploration of alternatives that wouldn't be race-based. Um, that is the legal framework that everybody from Antonin Scalia to Ruth Bader Ginsburg accepts on these questions. Uh, and then I think there's debates about what does and does not uh, qualify. Um, what I find striking at the moment is that uh, uh, you know, parts of the political spectrum have started to actually tout race-basedness as a general uh, uh, desir criterion of desirability, rather than as a last resort to be pursued in particular circumstances where uh, there's no other way to serve as compelling interests. So I think on this particular case, the Supreme Court's framework is actually right. We should just uh, actually have a consistency to apply it. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey Bristol. Make it even snappier, please. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'll try to be real quick. So I, I was just, you, in your talk, and I don't know maybe you do this in the book, you, you seem to conflate the racial situation in the United States with the ethnic situations in Europe. And it strikes me that those are two very different things. You know, for example, I'm from the South, I've lived all over the, the country. You know, when I'm in Chicago, when I lived in Chicago, it was much easier for me to get along and associate with black people, or get along with black people in Chicago than white Chicagoans. Because what I as an anthropologist think of my ethnicity was more similar to theirs. But I still faced the same barriers in engaging in their institutions that any other white Chicago would be. It wasn't like there was some, you know, copacetic existence between us. Um, and that was entirely based on race rather than ethnicity. Again, I think to my experience in Michigan, where you know, I find Michiganders to be absolutely confounding, um, ethnically about as far as I do can get from, I think, how I am as, and still be an American. But Livonia, I am well more accepted in Livonia than a black person from Detroit, who ethnically would be more similar to uh, the white people in Livonia. Um, and so, you know, you have this, this racial overtone and which is compounded by the fact that uh, those black Americans still have an American ethnic identity. There is ethnically almost no difference between me and another black and a black person from the South, um, other than the institutions we engage in. We eat the same food. We generally have very similar political beliefs. Uh, we often have similar values, vote differently. Um, but you know, it kind of, it's a weird divide because there's ethnic similarity, but extreme racial difference. And, and, and I think it's interesting. I'd be curious to hear the last thing I'll say on that point is, I'd be curious to know what this, what, what the sources are you're saying that the median African-American is, is middle class. That might be true. But my experience, again, in the South is that there is still very, if that's not, I mean, that's not true for, for Floridian communities, for Georgian communities. Of communities in Louisiana. It's, so you go in the suburbs, there are very few black people. You go in the inner cities in poorer areas and they're overwhelmingly black. I don't have the statistics to show that, but you know, I mean, it's just one of those things that if you just drive through, it's, it's obvious. Um, so what is the difference between the American situation and race and the European situation? I'm just not convinced that they're commensurate with one another. Yeah, so I, it's hard to sort of give it general account of differences. What, what I would say is that um, what the salient difference is and even which group you're going to belong to always depends on the context. And uh, you know, to any outsider, the kinds of uh, determinations that a society is going to make is always going to seem weird and arbitrary. I mean, the fact that uh, in the United States, if you have seven white grandparents and one black grandparent, uh, you could legitimately call yourself black and many people in society would consider you black, is very strange to people in other countries, but of course has a particular history in the United States because of a one drop rule and the nature of slavery and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I, I have friends who uh, are half white and half black and who are considered naturally African-American here, uh, but when they go back uh, to the country uh, of one of their parents in Africa, they're considered white, or they're certainly not considered black, because what's salient is the white ancestry. So the particular way in which those boundaries are drawn always differ from place to place. But I think that the essential problems that they pose uh, remain relatively similar. Now, it may be that certain kinds of ways of drawing those boundaries are more problematic, um, make it harder to sustain a diverse democracy than others, um, and so there may be some differences at the margin. Um, but I guess what I would say in general is like, yes, what's salient in different societies differs, differs hugely. Um, you know, in, growing up in Germany, it was very salient to me who is Turkish, because there was a major fault line in that society. Um, uh, it was not salient to me who is Latino, right? In the United States, people grow up and it's salient who is Latino, but it's not salient who is Turkish. Um, uh, but the basic problem of um, what common institutions we need to get along and how that groupishness can, can be weaponized and how it can start to tear societies along, I think is similar despite those differences. Thank you, um, Andy. We'll have the last question. Actually, I have a short question. Did you go to gymnasium or university with any Turkish 
students in Germany because I didn't. And you made this claim about second generation, third generation immigrants. And, and that doesn't seem like by my experience, it doesn't seem right. And in 2003, Angela Merkel said, we have to stop taking in people. We utterly failed at integration. And what should be involved then? And then Andy. Andy has the same question, maybe, actually. Andy, ask your question, and then Yasha can take them all at the same time. Happy to. Um, Yasha, thanks for your talk. And my question, I guess, begins in America, but um, also, as Anna says, is about Europe. Uh, beginning in America, I share your optimism and uh, live in Miami and um, am, am very uh, favorable to immigration and um, would hope that our policies in America um, are adjusted in a way that uh, makes it easier for people to immigrate. The question that I have is about Europe, which I understand less. Um, I had uh, clients in France and in Switzerland and recall conversations with them and uh, you know the multinational companies so elite and I would say they would seem more concerned about immigration than Americans. And I just wanted to ask you, how do you think um, immigration is playing out in the various Western European countries relative to America? Yeah. So, so look, I think that the biggest problem each, in each country is different, right? I and mean, the biggest problem in the United States uh, when it comes to diverse societies is the relationship between uh, not even whites and non-whites. I think it's between African-Americans and, and other groups. And that's because of the nature of chattel slavery and the long-term impact it has on the society, right? Like that's the toughest nut to crack in the United States. Immigration is relatively easy because the country always has been a country of immigrants. Um, and it's more difficult among some groups than among others because of various complicated questions to do with race. But, uh, uh, but actually, uh, Americans are used to having people come in. They have institutions that encourage the integration of immigrants. Immigrants integrate very well, um, right? More straightforward. In Europe, in most societies, you don't have a problem of uh, this population that has suffered this very long set of injustices and continues on average to earn less and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, in many European societies, not all of them, you don't have a long history of immigration. And so you have, for example, a much more rigid conception historically of who truly belongs in the society. Now, uh, that does make immigration more complicated in the United States. And certainly, Anna, when, when, when I was growing up, um, I, you know, I had a couple of Turkish classmates, but that was in Munich and their parents were architects who had just moved to Germany rather than the children of the grandchildren of guest workers. Uh, but that is really changing now. I mean, you see that the number of people, for example, with uh, Turkish heritage at gymnasium in, in Germany is really actually going up significantly. Um, that the social escalator took a long time to start working, but it is working now. And as I was saying, there is this study for Germany as well as other European countries showing that the children or grandchildren of uh, an immigrant who uh, doesn't have uh, an upper high school degree uh, from gymnasium are more likely to gain one themselves if he's an immigrant than if he is a non-immigrant. So, so you really do see that. It's a slow process, but it's a process that is working and that eventually I think will really lower those differences. Um, and, and you see it in the conceptions of a society, right? So um, uh, when I was growing up in Germany, it still seemed obvious that I'm not really German because my parents come from Poland and I'm Jewish and that somehow made me non-German. And certainly those Turkish kids, um, calling them Turkish kids now, those kids whose who's, you know, ancestors came from Turkey, um, we're not German. Uh, but today, I think that genuinely has changed. And we see that change in a lot of the polls um, about what makes a true German and so on that the World Value Survey and other people ask. Um, so, uh, so yes, the immigration topic is harder in, in, in Europe than it is in the United States for historical reasons. Um, and I was much more pessimistic about this 20 years ago 
Uh, but I'm actually surprised by the extent to which many Western European societies have changed their self-conception and become immigrant societies. And by the way, the percentage of foreign-born people in Germany is now close to what it is in the United States. Um, so so in, in, in reality, these are now deeply diverse societies. Um, we don't see deep segregation. Uh, we don't see a massive socioeconomic underclass. Um, there are some problems and it's taking a while, um, but, but, but I actually think that, uh, uh, that the reasons for optimism are stronger than the reasons for pessimism. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Yasha. This has been um, a wonderful conversation. You've been generous with your, well, of course, with your time, but especially with your arguments. So I wish you well and a great success with this new book. Thank, Thank you for having me, Javi, and wonderful to see everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Yasha. Yes.